Hey everyone, it's Strange Michael. I hope you're doing well today. Last year, in 2021, we had three films come out one week after the next called Fear Street, of course, based on the old R.L. Stein books. I only recently, last, I want to say December, I read the three or four Christmas-themed uh, Fear Street books. They were my first ever Fear Street books. I think it was Silent Night 1, 2, and 3. They were pretty uh, mediocre, and I'm a big R.L. Stein guy, big Goosebumps fan mainly. And I run another channel called Michael Goosebumps Fan. Many of you know me from that channel. So, Silent Night 1, 2, and 3 are not really my thing. <clears throat> when it comes to a mainstream Fear Street book, I haven't really read anything like that yet. Um, Silent Night 1, 2, and 3 are regarded as fairly good ones, so I'm not really sure if I'd consider myself a Fear Street fan, per se. And I never did want to get a Netflix account ever again. There was just not enough on here worth getting. My wife ended up having some things she wanted to see, so she got a, um, a Netflix account recently. <clears throat> so did my mom, as a matter of fact. I went over to my mom's house, and she and I sat down to watch Fear Street Part 1, 1994. Or when it came out, it was just called Fear Street, 1994. Now, two sequels, like I said, over the next couple of weeks when this movie came out, were also released. They keep going further and further back in the past, which is kind of cool. I think it's neat to have a whole trilogy made from the beginning, from the get-go, released all in one go. Now, for me, I gotta tell you, 1994 was kind of a disappointment. I've heard it's not the best of the three, but I've heard it's fairly solid, and I would agree it has its solid moments. It has some good things here that I did enjoy. Being born in 1994, it was kind of cool seeing a lot of the 90s throwback stuff at that time, <clears throat> even before I was born. It's kind of a... <clears throat> excuse me. It kind of starts off as a, as a kind of 1990s slasher thing. It has a lot of references in the opening prologue, to scream, a lot of homages to scream in the beginning. As the film goes on, you have a lot of cool homages to things like Friday the 13th, for example. Uh, there are multiple killers in this movie, for example, which is kind of neat. But I will say this, one of the biggest surprises to me is this is not just a straight-up slasher. It's kind of a, a supernatural thing. And it's kind of cool because of that. I like how it's kind of a newer take on a slasher subgenre. Uh, and I like that a lot. I do have to admire 1994 for doing that. Fear Street, in general, deserved something nice like that. I don't know how good the overall trilogy is. It'll be a little bit till I can get to Part 2 and Part 3. Maybe not all the way until till, uh, January. I don't know yet. But <clears throat> um, I hope that they're good. I hope they're better than this movie was. Because this was kind of mediocre, but it was above average, but it was kind of mediocre for the most part. One of the biggest issues you have is that it feels like Netflix. <laughs> All of the typical tropes of a Netflix series or movie or anything like that nowadays, all the SJW tropes and whatever, are all in here. They're all in here. Uh, the aesthetics of wanting to be a 1990s thing, they look good, but they're kind of a, a Netflix tropey type of thing, the way Stranger Things is an 80s kind of throwback type of aesthetic. If you're not into that, you probably won't be into this. If you're not into typical bland radi radio uh, music from the 90s, that's what a lot of this movie has. Uh, it's, it's kind of rub different audiences different ways. Let's maybe, let's be honest about it. Now we follow a main chick named Dina, who is absolutely awful. I can't stand her. <laughs> it's not the actress's fault. Let me tell you up front, I think all the actors and actresses are really good here. But Dina, I can't stand. I think she's just an awful, unlikable person. She reminds me of the newer protagonist from the newest Hellraiser film from David Bruckner, the uh, drug addict girl. This Dina girl just gets on my last nerve. She is so unlikable. She is a homosexual. She's a girl, lesbian, whatever. And uh, she has a closeted girlfriend who recently moved away and broke up with her. And uh, the other girl is much, much, much more likable. Very sweet girl, as a matter of fact. But this main chick, Dina, is like begrudged to her because the other girl didn't come out out of this worry that everybody in her life would hate her guts and whatever. Uh, it is the 90s. I don't really think that would happen, but uh, say what you will, but I don't think it would have happened in the 90s. Um, anyway, there's a lot of just animosity towards this ex-girlfriend over that. So a lot of it is her her just walking around moaning and groaning like a typical teenager. Yes, it's realistic, but no, it's not fun to watch. Uh, she's just complaining all the time. She's just a brat. She has a younger brother who was obsessed with urban legends and stuff. I love this kid. He did great, too. Really fun. Probably one of my favorite characters of the film. Um, and Dina has two other friends who are selling drugs to try to make their way into life and get out of town and get into some kind of schooling or something. It's not that they're good people, but those are likable people. I do like those characters a lot more than I like Dina. 
And Bedina is just a spiteful, mean person. I just can't stand her. And eventually, when she goes to a football game, uh, she crosses paths with her ex. And <laughs> the school there, and the school in Shadyside, where Dina is from, have kind of a... Kind of this, you know... <laughs> confrontation like the schools don't get along it's that school pride school spirit type stuff and when they have this football game or whatever uh things just get worse and worse basically that closeted girlfriend has now moved on with a boyfriend and whatever to kind of look i guess normal to everybody the way she sees it and uh, dina kind of hates that about her well when they're driving home in their school bus uh they happen to see a car that is trying to mess with the school bus and trying to tail them and whatever and trying to just mess with them in general. And they start trying to like throw a cooler out <laughs> to try to dump like ice water or something on that guy's car. It turns out this is the closeted girlfriend's boyfriend's car and they're all in the car messing with this school bus even though the ex-girlfriend doesn't want to. This all seems compl complicated and just too much, I understand, but I'm just saying I have to tell you the general plot. <laughs> I have to tell you the general plot. Uh, that car wrecks and uh, when the ex-girlfriend gets out of that car, she accidentally touches the ground in a certain spot and gets some blood in there. And she has a weird vision about a, uh, about a witch that was put to death many, many, many hundreds of years ago in the same town, Shadyside, uh, named Sarah Fear, I believe is the name. And this kind of opens up the door to all the supernatural-esque type of stuff going on. Now that's pretty much the general plot. A lot of this is kind of a balance between Dina and this ex-girlfriend of hers. Uh, a lot of it's focused on the ex-girlfriend. And I'll tell you this, for the most part, aside from the, the typical SJW Netflix stuff, I didn't hate the movie at all. I actually see a lot of negativity towards it now, a whole year later, which kind of surprised me. I think it's just slightly above average, as I said. Uh, the look of it's very well done, the directing is very well done, the acting from everybody, even in small parts, are really good. The supernatural stuff is handled very well, in my opinion. I think the outcome of the end of the film, of how they have to solve this situation, of this... It's kind of like a, like a haunting, but kind of not. It kind of reminds me a lot of It Follows. I think there's some inspiration from It Follows in this movie. Those kind of elements, I really love about it. I think those are the best parts of this film. But having Dina be our main character... It's horrible. I can't stand her. I think most viewers couldn't stand her from what I'm seeing online. And it seems to me, the little hints of her in 2 and 3, the second and third movies, people don't really seem to improve much more about her uh, overall demeanor and whether they like her or not. Because by the end of this film, we don't really get an entire solution. Apparently the whole trilogy will tie up some more loose ends, even though 2 and 3 are more flashbacks to back in the day with some other things that happened here. Let's talk about the killers a little bit. Uh, there's not too many I remember. I think there's like three or four different ones. I know one is like a straight-up Jason Voorhees type of dude, uh, mainly from part two with the sack over his head. He's great. I love him. He looks amazing with the axe and kind of the, the Jack Torrance flannel and stuff. Oh, it looks great. I love it. Um, he's scary. He seems like he wouldn't be able to stop if he chases you. I love this guy. Fantastic. My favorite killer in the whole film. You have the one from... Uh, these are not really Fear Street per se. These are kind of just R.L. Stein books from back in the Point Horror days, if you know what that is. Uh, he wrote a series called Point Horror, kind of with a bunch of other authors. And there was a couple of books he did called Halloween Night 1 and 2. The Halloween Night 1 and 2 costumes are in this movie. It's just like a skull with a hood up. Uh, it's kind of reminiscent of Scream, which again, this film was kind of going for that because it's a 90s thing. And it's great. I love it. All the Scream throwback stuff, all the Friday the 13th throwback stuff, that all is fantastic. I love that one killer with the sack head thing. But the skull mask looking stuff, it's great. I love the performance from the actor and actor. I, I guess it's multiple actors. I don't know. Whoever is in that costume, it's great. I think everybody did really well with that. You have another girl who is a... She was kind of a psychopath who's also one of the killers. Um, she's really cool. I like her a lot, too. There's just a lot to talk about with all this stuff. I feel like there's one more killer I'm not thinking of right now. I cannot remember who it was, but it doesn't matter, really. Uh... Aside from Dina being awful, everything else has been great. Um, the look of it's good. The writing, for the most part, is good, aside from Dina. It, she has to be one of those Marvel, modern-day Marvel types of characters uh, from the, the Marvel comics. You know, not so much the MCU, but kind of that, too, in the new phases. But uh, she reminds me of what Marvel started doing, where they had every single character talk the exact same way. Everybody had to be a spiteful bitch 
Everybody had to have this one-liner Joss Whedon-esque writing, and it's still haunted comics to this day, and it's a mess, and it's still haunted the MCU to this day. It's haunted pop culture to this day. Uh, it's just... That harms this movie so much, and it ruins it so much. Uh, but not only that, it, it's just an above-average film. I think it's got some great twists in here, some great uh, expansion on the supernatural slasher type of subgenre. If that's a part subgenre of the slasher subgenre, I don't know. But uh, I think it perfects that in a lot of ways, but it has its flaws, nonetheless. The music in here is pretty solid. Like I said, a lot of it's just radio hits and whatever. There is a lot of gore and blood in here, one in particular involving a store. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't expect that. I genuinely did not expect what I saw. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of shocking. You know, this film, when I talk about its woke politics nonsense, one of the things that irritates me the most is how we're trying our best at the end of the movie to take people who were not good people and say they were good people because of feelings and friendships and stuff. I'm sure the Jeffrey Dahmer's family loved him. I'm sure of that. But that doesn't mean they aren't disappointed and think that their son was an awful person. You know? So when I got to the end parts of this movie, and certain things would be said or revealed or whatever, or like how the media reacted to this whole shady side nightmare with uh, these killers coming back and whatever, people getting killed left and right. When that whole thing was happening, the idea that people should not, and that the news media, for example, shouldn't have to do its job and call a bad person a bad person, it's baffling to me. I can't believe the kind of lessons Dina tries to teach the audience at the end of this film. It just sounds like the kind of stupidity that people like Netflix preaches nowadays. It's crazy to me. Anyway, uh, moving along, though, to the rating of this film. When it comes to Fear Street 1994 or Fear Street Part 1 1994, it's really solid. But that's about it. It's just, it's a fine, solid film. It's got some stuff I really, really love about it. If we did not have the whole 90s nostalgia throwback thing, this film would not be as special as it is. A lot of people would overlook this thing. But... Even though it has its turdish moments and the stench of a turd, it still has some really good stuff in here. It's kind of a beautiful turd, if you will. Uh, I would give it like a 3 out of 5 stars. It's got some cool things to it. It's just... It's not perfect. And I hope what 2 and 3 are going to do is really perfect what this movie was. I had heard Part 3 is a lot of people's favorite. I believe Part 3 was the one. And I hope that's the case. I really do. But anyway, it's a full-fledged trilogy. Understand if you go into this movie, if you haven't seen it yet, understand that you have to kind of watch part one, two, and three back to back because part one doesn't really end, per se. It doesn't have like a full-fledged conclusion where it can stand alone. It carries into two, and apparently two carries into three. Uh, so just understand that. It's not just about the flashbacks in two and three and the kind of throwback to old times in those movies. You have to understand there's a lot more going on than you realize by the end of this movie. A little too much, but still. 3 out of 5 stars for me. It's kind of a high 3 out of 5, though. I do want to specify that. This is fairly close to being a 4, but it just doesn't get there. It would be so close, so close, but it just doesn't hit there. What did you guys think about Fear Street Part 1, 1994, or the overall trilogy? I'd love to hear all that down below, too. I have not seen 2 and 3 yet. Like I said, I plan on watching that at some point, but we'll see. It might be till January. I don't know, like I said, but uh, we'll see what happens. Anyway... What did you guys think about it? I'd love to hear what your thoughts and comments are down in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching my review. God bless you, and goodbye.